Hey, this is Ken Stringfellow of The Posies, The Disciplines, and many other things. You're listening to Retrospectives with John Broughton on 3SER KC Radio. Have a good one. I'll try not to uh, test your memory too much, but we'll see how we go. I'm up for it. Okay. Uh, the, the core beginnings of the Posies was, was that of a, a duo situation w- with yourself and John. Was that the initial intent to continue in that in that vein, or was there always an aspiration of developing into a, a fully-fledged rock and roll band that it became? Uh, we actually initially envisioned uh, our first recordings that ended up being our first album failure that was recorded just by the two of us to be a kind of demo so that we could find uh, like-minded musicians because we just weren't finding people who, you know, seemed to get what we were trying to do when we tried to explain it. And um, so uh, we thought, oh, we'll just record a few songs and and give them to people. Maybe someone will want to be in a band with us. Uh, It's only by accident that it ended up becoming like a release in a way. We... um, it just sort of got around, and people started playing it on the radio, strangely enough. Uh, but, yeah, we, we wanted to have a band, and, and just, you know, we, we came from this small town, and we, even though I was already living in Seattle, uh, I didn't know that many people there, and just I just didn't have the connections to find that many musicians, so we were kind of at a loss for how to get them, and that's that was one of the tools that we that we fabricated to get musicians now, after that first independent release you you got uh, hooked up with uh, with geffen records and, and put out dear 23 signing to geffen and, and the notoriety that that first release with geffen brought to you did it um, lead you to reassess your ambitions for the band uh well i mean we we were ambitious really to begin with i i think it um I think the touring that we did for that record sort of showed us like how hard we were going to have to work uh, because we did get some, you know, MTV airplay and lots of radio airplay and lots of good reviews. And um, our live show, we had never really toured before that record came out, and our live show was, you know, we we were trying to play the record in a way, and and uh, we realized that we really had to develop we still had more room to grow uh, we're well, not more room to grow but we still had it was necessary for us to grow before we were really going to get our message across as it were with two uh, strong songwriting talents in the band with yourself and john how did the the songwriting process work or the song selection process work when it when it came to selecting songs to record well um yeah we we usually had a, a surplus and Back in those days, we were pretty meticulous about demoing everything, and so and we were playing this stuff live. So we had a pretty good idea of how stuff was, you know, what was going to fit on the record and how it was going to fit together. Um, you know, uh, as we were making our next two albums after G23, Frosting on the Beater and Amazing Disgrace, like we were, all we we had a lot of the songs that would end up on the following record. Uh, in those sessions, for example songs that ended up on Amazing Disgrace we had tried to record for Frosting and they didn't fit in. Songs that we recorded for Amazing Disgrace that didn't fit in ended up on Success and so forth. Um, you know, we just, um, but as far as, you know, I mean, we, 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 we had to make some sacrifices, you know, as far as the songs we thought were really good that, you know, at the time when you're making a record, well, it just didn't seem like they would see the light of day, and it seemed quite tragic. But actually, we managed to sort of keep pushing them through to get on later records. So we got everything out the door that needed to get out. Yeah. How how would you describe your working relationship with John through the years? Uh, do you, or do you think it's best not to try and analyze such things? Um. No. I mean, I I think we started out like um. Really, like uh, very working very closely together and you know and it's just the two of us even after it was just the two of us it was really our project and the other guys that first played with us for our live show Mike Musburger the drummer and Rick Roberts now Arthur Roberts the bass player um, <clears throat> you know I mean like they really had a hard time sort of busting into our little like um, kind of psychic community that John and I had um, so we were working really closely together, and then 
as we became more of a live band, the responsibilities musically spread out a little bit more. Um, in a weird way, it had an effect of like, you know, by dividing our musical agenda by four instead of two, like, I don't know, it, it was strange. Like, it, it put John and I farther apart in a way. Yeah. Um, and, and that, and then, like, the, the pretty heavy duty touring schedule that we had from 1991 to 1996, really, um, actually, from, even from 1990 to 1996, uh, we were just always on tour and, uh, I think that, you know, the, the it was too much togetherness, as it were, and we didn't really have time to develop a life outside of the of the band. Really, I mean, it was a I mean, we we wanted to tour, and we wanted to, you know, develop our live performance, and we wanted to connect the audiences and all this stuff. I mean, that was it was wasn't like we had no choice in the matter. Of course, we had a choice in the matter, but. Um, I think we we were our, um, the ambitiousness of, the, uh, of what we did sort of you know it, it it burned us out I think actually to be honest and, and it uh, we we were we weren't appreciating each other or supporting each other in the way that we should and uh, and th- that made it more difficult to to work together and uh, those things have a tendency to, to spiral in a downward fashion, you know, as you get further away, then you get, that makes you get further away, and that makes you take a further step back, and then, our, you know, just, our communication just wasn't, wasn't happening, and, you know, we were quite young, so, uh, we didn't, we didn't have a lot of skills that you need to develop to, to communicate and to uh, alleviate any tensions or problems you might be having, I mean, we didn't really know how to, we didn't have the, the greatest people skills. Um, you know, we weren't bad people and we weren't constantly, like, in a bad situation, but little things can go a long way uh, and, and you know, little any little disagreements can get magnified if they don't get worked out. So that's kind of how it happened. And then, you know, once we took a break from each other, we you know, our band kind of came to, came to a conclusion for, for a couple of years. John and I once again went out and sort of looked each other up and did a tour together, just the two of us. And, you know, we sort of developed a new rapport with sort of respect for what each other had become and that we developed lives outside of the context of working together and that give, made us a little more um, multidimensional. Yeah. And that, that helped, you know. There were quite a few lineup changes in the band through the night. He's looking back, is it a regret that the band wasn't able to settle into into one particular lineup for a significant period of time? Well, uh, not really. I mean, like, uh, I think working with different people, you know, kept things pretty fresh, really, mm-hmm. and brought interesting dimensions to the band. I mean, it, it's not a conventional band story. Uh, that's for sure, and in that sense, I think it's interesting. I mean, you know, uh, it's not quite as straightforward as some band stories are. You know, there's two guys, then two plus two, then two plus another two, and then two plus another two, and um, now two plus yet another two. And uh, but having said that, now that we've found like two great people to play with, and we've been playing with. Matt Harris, our bass player, and Darius Minwala, our drummer, for eight years. Uh, that that's a nice, you know, we've been able to build something that we really weren't able to build before. Yeah. Uh, and I think that that the live set is even more smoking than our most smoking set in the '90s. And I, I think that we have, uh, well, I mean, we're just better players and better listeners which is of course a key to being a great player there was an, an abandoned album there in the early 90s forever to be known as the, the lost sessions what exactly happened there for, for that project to be completely shelved as it was well that's sort of a misnomer i mean I, I don't think it was quite a complete album uh we recorded some songs um with our live sound engineer in 1991 
and just straight off coming off the road uh, from uh, touring for J23. And there was some good stuff on there, uh, but also it was clear that, you know, we were being too hasty and that we really needed to take it to one more iteration and and maybe record in a slightly more ambitious fashion, you know, like we wanted to do something down and dirty just because Year 23 had been such a studio project, you know, we wanted something to really reflect our touring experience that we'd never had before. Uh, but that was a bit of a reactionary way of thinking, and it was kind of clear getting into those sessions that we really wanted to do something that was in between, like, you know, something that reflected the growth that we'd undergone, but, you know, was utilized maybe some of the studio uh, possibilities that we had access to. How about the, the band's relationship with Geffen Records at the time? Did they um, try to involve themselves much in the uh, creative process? Mm, well, I mean, they can't really involve themselves in the creative process. I mean, they're they're on another side, really. But they they gave us a lot of advice, you know. I mean, um, and certainly if we were if we were stuck, you know, uh, they would. Uh, you know, try and help us think our way through it in a way. Um, you know, I think we all always knew when something wasn't quite done. Um, and, you know, we usually were thinking along the same lines when we, when we, when they said, you know, like, you're, I think that record's really close, but maybe you need to keep trying and with a couple more things. and. Usually we were thinking the exact same thing, you know, but, you know, of course we wanted it to be done in a way because we were impatient, but we always, you know, it was never a surprise when, when we'd have these conversations and they would go, our A&R guy would go, are you guys really sure? Because, you know, like, like it seems like there's just a couple key elements missing and maybe you should keep trying. And, and we're like, yeah, I know. And so then we would, and it always kind of worked to that conclusion. But as far like, our label never said like, uh, hey, we got these lyrics you wrote. You know, I mean, the, the, at the end of the day, the creative job is up to us, of course. Yeah. Do you think the band at times was ever a victim of its own geography that it had you know, had had much more to offer in terms of melody and strong structure than some of the other bands coming out of Washington, particularly the Seattle grunge scene? Were you finding yourselves uh, unfairly associated alongside some of those bands? No, I think it was pretty clear that we were quite different. So, I mean, I don't think anybody associated us with those kind of bands. Uh, I think that being from that area with the cool factor of being from Seattle was a great boon. I mean, I guarantee if our band had developed in West Virginia, you wouldn't, we wouldn't be having this conversation right now. <laughs> Probably um, right, yeah. So, uh, I think that we were really in the right place at the right time. And I, I think that by not being too fashionable, um, we've never really been so easy. We don't. We didn't really have a sell-by date. You know, we we really seem to have uh, been able to slide from era to era. Whereas maybe some bands that were just right in with the times, you know, that that can be a bad thing over time because time moves on. And if you're if you're associated with a particular time, you know, it's that's forever. And uh, you know, I mean, I think we've been able to sort of sidestep that. We were never so overwhelmingly associated with one particular moment that that we can't get past it. Yeah. Or that our audience can't get past it. More importantly, can you pinpoint an album or a particular moment when you felt the band had really hit its stride and and uh, hit the mark and became the band that you wanted it to be? Well, I felt like the uh, the album Amazing Disgrace and all the shows that we did touring for it were 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 very intense, you know, and very. I think we were really we we're really onto something. I think that's a very strong record, and uh, you know, I also think that uh, I think that I, our, our, the last two years of live shows we've been doing, uh, I feel like something is really grown in the band I think just by virtue of the fact that we 
are touring a little less frequently. Uh, but kind of, you know, we'll get together and do these like 10 date things in Spain or something like that, you know, kind of these little short bursts. I think that, um, getting, getting a step away from it has given us a nice perspective and that we really appreciate it when we do get together and play and, I, and, and we really live for those moments. And, and, uh, I think that that has made us a better live band, even on our last album, you know, where we did like 200 shows and. You know, at one point in our U.S. tour, we did 33 dates in a row, you know, with no days off. I mean, there were moments, probably, when we weren't appreciating it as much as we could when we were just trying to hold on and not collapse, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, I think we learned some lessons from that experience. Um, so, I don't know, in one way, you know, our live show, I think, is really at its peak, in a way. Uh, because it's still quite furious, but it's done with a little more finesse. Yeah. When you went in to record that uh, last album in, in 98, Success, before the, the band split the first time, did you go in with the knowledge that this may be the last album for the band? Was the split already imminent at that stage? Yeah, I, I, John had sort of said, like, this is as far as I'm willing to go at this time. And, uh, I, you know, I wanted things to keep going, um, but... That's the way the cookie crumbles, as they say. Mm. So yeah, we, I mean, it was, it was pretty apparent. When you came to reconvene the posies to its current state, were you particularly conscious of doing things a little differently second time around? Oh, most definitely. Yeah, there's a lot. Of, there's still adjustments to be made, but definitely. Um, I mean, just thinking how, how we communicated, and and the kind of how we you know to think you know uh how we thought of each other and to think of the other person uh a little bit more in certain instances uh you know um i think that those kind of developments were um important <laughs> <laughs> Now, outside of the posies, you've always kept uh, very busy. There's always numerous uh, other projects projects here that you've been involved with. Uh, are you a restless kind of guy? Do you feel the need to often move on to something different? Well, I think I don't really... I mean, when, when something is good, I, I, I really stick with it. I mean, I haven't, you know, uh, been, done like that many musical projects over the year. I mean, I have and I haven't, but there's a difference between like bands that are my band that I play with over the years and like little one-off things that were more just for a fun moment. Yeah. Uh, so except taking those things away, um, the, the band thing, I mean, you know, like it's really, um, you know, the posies, the disciplines, my current band with some guys from Norway that we've made a record. It hasn't come out in Australia, but it's been out in Europe and the States, et cetera. Uh, hasn't come out in Australia yet. Um, uh, you know, the guys in those bands, they're not always available, so, you know, I try and keep them, each thing as busy as I can, up to its limits, and I do some solo stuff, just playing by myself, which is a, a much needed kind of feeling in my life, too. I like to express myself in that way, too. And then there's just other things that come along, you know, producing and playing with different people in the studio or live that, that, that are more um, special short-term situations, I mean, unless they turn into longer ones. Uh, I also had, you know, I mean, I spent seven years touring and recording with R.E.M. Uh, that's a significant thing. Mm. Um, I spent a, a year or so playing with this band called Lagwagon, it's kind of punk man from California, um, these things come up too, but I, I mean, I'm a curious person and I like to be in different situations and play with different people from different musical cultures and people from different parts of the world and all that kind of stuff. Um, and also, you know, I mean, I, just to, to be, uh, to, to make a living in music, of course, it, it's necessary for me to be very flexible and really apply myself to a number of different situations and try and be good at a lot of things so that I'm useful. Um, 
so it's, there's that too. Now, your work with uh, REM would have given you a, a first-hand look at the commercially successful side of the music industry on, on a grand scale. Uh, from what you saw, is it all that it's cracked up to be? Uh, well, I mean, first of all, I, I think REM is a band that operates very differently. You know, I mean, like, within the world of bands that have sold millions of records, shall we say, uh, or artists or whatever, I mean, I'm sure there's very little common ground in the day I'm just assuming I don't know but from what I've heard there's very little common ground in the day-to-day -day life and operations of an REM and the day-to-day -day life and operations of you know Mariah Carey for example mm -hmm. um, so I mean I, I, I think there isn't I think each each band each artist like is a special case so it's, you can't really extrapolate and just say oh they're one of them now that they've become successful, uh, I, I think that you know different organizations have react to that in different ways. Um, you know, having said that, I mean, like, uh, you know, it, I could also say that hey, you know, here are three guys who have had lots of success and done lots of things and have made huge amounts of money and all this kind of stuff. And at the end of the day, you know, they are people, and they have they have good days and bad days, and things that, you know, they have disappointments, they have triumphs, they have, you know, it's all there. It, it, it's still life. Life is still life, and not all of their problems have been solved by their success. Mm. Uh, so you you know, it's not an answer to anything. It just is what it is, it, it, that, and, and it's one more. Let you still have to live your life. You still have to work hard to be the best person you can you can be. You also worked with a, another band that was no doubt an influence on you, and no doubt you're a big fan of in Big Star. Uh, yeah. How was that experience for you? Um, well, it's been it's been great. I mean, um, it's a very special. Association an opportunity to play with with Alex and Jody, um, you know, music that I listen to and love so much. I mean, that, same with REM. Really, I mean, REM was really one of my favorite bands growing up. So those two situations are are really inexplicable in my mind. Actually, I, I mean, I'm I'm just amazed that I ended up in those situations. Um, you know, uh, and I just try and appreciate it every 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 moment. You know, I mean, I never really can imagine going. Oh man, I've got to play the Space Star show. What a bummer! I mean, like that just is that just is not going to happen. Is it a strange experience in those situations being being a fan of those bands for so long? Is it hard to step away from being a fan and, and focus on it as work? Well. Let's be clear that um, there's work, which is like doing something that you may or may not choose to do, but you have a motivation to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, in that sense, playing with Big Star or I Am is, isn't necessarily what we call work in the classical sense, although there's responsibility. Um, but, uh, you know, I mean, also there's the day-to-day -day experience of doing stuff and <clears throat> having you know I mean we have to get we have to get the job done as it were you know we have to play a good show and with REM I just you know I have to uh, well play a good show and and uh, you know come up with things in the studio when I'm playing with them that I that I think will help their record or whatever um, and at that point it's just about the task at hand and you know, I mean, if I, I mean, I'm not really thinking about, wow, I'm, I'm so into these, but this band, you know, I mean, that's just, that's just not, it's a little weird. I mean, like, you know, after the first couple of days, I could kind of calm down about it, um, and then think about what am I here for, and what am, what am, what do I need to do to make this, uh, sit, to, you know, how can I be of help? Hmm. Basically, what I think about. 
I saw on the, the Posies website you describe your solo albums as uh, each one scratching a particular itch that you had at the time. Is that the criteria you use when recording solo material to wait until there is an itch that needs scratching? Um, maybe. Um, yeah, maybe. I, I I record them very infrequently. You know, I make one or two per decade, it seems. Uh, and I think I I just sort of put stuff off to the side that I don't feel I can fit in anywhere else, or that I don't want to fit in somewhere else. And when I have enough of them around, I put it out as an album on its own. Um, so, you know, may, maybe in some cases there are some directions that are just peculiar to my own thing that, you know, I don't know if anybody wants to go there with me. And so I go there myself, mm. uh, I guess. Uh, you know, like a band, uh, you know, like the Disciplines or the Posies, has a has a very specific kind of, I think. I mean, we can push the limits of that framework, but it has a framework, and that's a context that makes it, that gives it focus. Um, and you know, you can mess with that formula a lot, but I, I think it's it's cool to, it has a trueness to it, and it and that's, it's easy to know when you're when something fits or doesn't uh, and with a solo record it has its own trueness but that trueness reflects my own personal diversity uh, and so I can I can go in many different directions uh, and that's to me what's satisfying about those solo records you know I can I can do a lot of different things on it where a band like should be more structured in a way tell us about the disciplines and, and how that one all came together well, um, I, my bandmates are Norwegian, and I live in Paris, and, you know, I'm a frequent, I'm frequently touring around Europe and playing, and, and Norway has been a particularly good spot for me and very receptive. So um, I got to know them and when they were in another band called Briskeby that was a really successful Norwegian band, singing in English, but lots of big hits, and very kind of a very very commercial pop band in a way but with really good songs and really cool production and you know they're just they were commercial but more that they were just kind of epic and really good and it happened to get quite popular but they're very appealing shall we say and I, I did something with them where I sang a song like a duet with their singer they had a female singer and um after, you know, and through that experience, you know, we just saw that we had a lot of musical chemistry, and their band kind of came to an end. Um, but uh, you know, the guys wanted to try something, and at first it was kind of a thought of as just a you know maybe a one-time just jam or I don't know one of those kind of things, and it and it was quickly clear that there's something special here, and that it warranted serious attention and so we developed it and wrote lots of songs together and started playing shows and really took off and it's really something kind of the band we all wish we'd always had in a way mm. uh, not, to, not to detract from our other work and not to say that I wish I'd never done the poses or something like that but uh, you know like there's just something very immediate and supercharged and liberating and and fun and inclusive and warm and great about this band it's it's like a it's like a very fuzzy punk band in a way we don't really play punk music but our shows have a very down and dirty you know very vital very high energy aspect but the there's it's it's like the best moments of punk that i experienced growing up it's very inclusive uh you know, um, and and the shows are a really warm experience. Now, you mentioned to me in email that you're doing some studio work at the moment. In fact, that's where I'm talking to you right now. Can you tell us uh, what you're working on there? 
Yeah, I'm here for a couple of days working with a astronomer named Tara Angel, and uh, she's uh, very good. We're working on some stuff for what would be her next record. And what about for yourself? Any uh, recording plans on the horizon? Well, um, the Disciplines album is still coming out in many places. Uh, it's a little bit like the situation uh, with ACDC in that they, when they made their first, when their first record came out in like the States and Britain, they were already releasing their second one in Australia, uh, et cetera, and that, that took a few years for them to get, get on a, get that schedule caught up. Yep. Um, and our situation is really very similar and that, you know, we're basically getting ready to work on our second album, uh, hoping to release it in Norway in the spring. And our first album is, you know, it's still coming out in many parts of the world and, uh, you know, hope we'll be, uh, you know, I'd love to get it out in Australia. I haven't really figured out how yet. Um, but, you know, even if I figure that out next week, by the time it happened, we'd be well into working on our second record. So that kind of thing. So that's in the pipeline. We've been talking about doing a Posey's record next year. Um, and, you know, I mean, I have stuff for a solo record, but I just don't see when I'd have time to really do it and go on tour and do it properly. So yeah. I'm just sort of saving that up. Uh, in the meantime, I've, I, you know, I've got these two band things in the pipeline. Fantastic. Plenty to keep you busy. It's more than that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm going on all cylinders at all times. Fantastic. Ken, great to catch up with you. Thanks so much for uh, taking time out of your, uh, your schedule there to uh, have a chat with us. Yeah. You know, uh, I don't know if, um, you know, if you can get the disciplines. If I can, maybe I can send you a song by email or something. That would be great, yeah. We can make use can of that. Play it in your show and maybe help us start making the introduction to your country and we can get the record out there. That'll be wonderful. It'll be great to see you down here again, whether it's with the Disciplines, the Posies, or, or just yourself with your acoustic guitar. It'll be great to see you back here again. Cheers, man. Okay. And take care, and uh, hopefully we'll see you real soon. All right, man. Take care. Thanks, Ken. All right. All right thanks. Bye. Bye. -bye.